Ready? You're muted. Let's make sure your sound is working. Yeah, is it working? Yep. Okay, good. Yeah, that's part of the reason I'm here and not in my house because who knows? Who knows? I think I figured out that part of the issue this morning is I might have had another window open that was also running audio like from a previous meeting or something like that. And that might have been why it was causing problems, but that was weird though, because I was on you know video yeah. meetings for three hours straight and then all of a sudden it doesn't work anymore. It happens. <clears throat> all right. Well this should be fun. I, think I can hit, I can hit start webinar if you want so people can start loading in. Yeah, give us just a second. I'm not sure I want everybody staring at us while I'm trying to get gear up here for just to be ready. So, <laughs> um, so I'm just going to keep a running list of speakers or requested speakers, and then I can pull up the list of people who might be raising their hands. It's going to be a little hard to keep track of all of them because there's going to be a lot, but um, I hit share screen, you can see it. Yep, I'm seeing the version with the slides on the side. Okay. Yeah, I so got to remember how I took that off. What happens if you click the button down at the bottom to show the slideshow? How's that? Now I don't see it. But you but have the note section over there? No, did it move to another screen on one of your, you might be able to it, move. It blocks all my screens, so. Hmm. It's not on there anymore, right? Uh-uh. All right, good. <clears throat> Okay, well, I'm ready when you are, I guess. Okay, smile, look happy. <laughs> yeah, exactly. It's recording. Okay. And it's live, so we'll have people coming in here. We are live now.
welcome everybody who's signing on as attendees. Um, you're not allowed to talk um, until prompted to do so, and we'll have instructions for that as soon as uh, everybody logs on and we get started with the meeting. So uh, thanks for joining us. It looks like it's still 4.59, so we'll give the rest of the folks another minute to jump on. So thanks for your patience. Kind of that awkward waiting moment. Right, watching a pot boil until the clock hits five. <laughs> okay, well, I think we might be there. Um, we can give everybody just another few seconds to join on. Matt, do you want to go ahead and pull up some slides while we're doing that? Yeah. Welcome, everybody. Thanks for joining us this afternoon. Oh, they're off. I'm off? Yeah. I wonder why it does that. I might have to just leave that screen open. Okay. Let's do this and share screen. Well, well, you're pulling that up. How's that? Um, good. Okay, so. Okay, well, I think we are ready to begin. And um, thank you to all the people who have joined us on this uh, webinar this afternoon. Um, I show that we have about 23 people who are watching, and I know we had a lot more people signed up, so I'm sure we'll have probably some other people joining on shortly. Um, so as Matt mentioned to some of you who came on early, um, we have a, a brief presentation from staff. The purpose of this session today is to uh, give you some information about the update and a proposed revised schedule and the approach to updating regulations, including uh, guidance that we've heard from the commissioners most recently. Um, we want to make sure that you're all aware of upcoming um, opportunities to participate in this process and, and share your ideas. Uh, we have some information also about um, what we learned from the first questionnaire that we put out to get some initial input from folks in the community about what's um, important to you and, and what you'd like to see included in this approach. Um, and, then, uh, we had, and then we do have um, time for participation tonight. Most of this meeting after the first 10 minutes will really be about hearing from you all and gathering additional input. Um, I do wanna say that this will not be the only opportunity for that, far from it. Um, you'll see a schedule from Matt here coming up shortly where you'll see that there's about uh, probably seven or eight or more opportunities for public participation and helping to guide and shape where we go with the updated regulations in the next um, several months. So, um, so this is really just a meeting about the schedule and the approach and to get an initial understanding of some of the important interests from the community about what we should be um, addressing as we move forward. So. Matt, if you can go on to the next slide. Okay, so 
Um, so for tonight's session, I know you probably all participated in far more Zoom meetings than you care to these days and webinars and so on. Um, so we do have a couple polls that we'll throw up after we've presented some information in the slides just to really gauge um, whether there's a sense from those who are participating, are, are things going in the right direction? Are there things that you'd like to see us adjust as we work on the schedule um, and that sort of thing? So they're, they're not scientific questionnaires or anything like that. They're really just to take the pulse of the people who are participating. Um, you could also simultaneously go into the chat box. Um, anytime you have comments or suggestions, we are gonna save um, comments from the chat box. We are recording this meeting too. So we'll have um, anything that you provide in the way of verbal comments or written comments. Um, when we get to the part of the meeting right after these quick polls, um, then we'll start to ask if those of you who are on here, if you have um, verbal comments that you'd like to make, um, please raise your hands. I'll keep a list and Matt and I will help facilitate that part of the meeting. Um, we'd ask you to limit your time, at least in the first round, just um, not because this is a public hearing and we're trying to be rigid, but just because we want to make sure that you know, everybody has a chance to give some comments and we'll cycle back through if you've made a first comment and then um, others have commented, then we'll um, ask you to speak again. Uh, but we just ask that you keep your comments limited to a couple of minutes so others can speak to. And then of course, if you have many, many comments and want to share um, something more extensive, you can email and you can do other things too. So um, again, this will be just the initial meeting around um, process schedule approach primarily. So um, thank you very much again for attending. I'm gonna hand it over to Matt now to talk about the approach um, and the project. Got to remember to unmute myself. Uh, thanks again, Leslie. Um, Matt Lafferty, I'm the principal planner uh, with the, current, the community development department. I'm working on long range planning matters and probably familiar with most of you from the activities that we had last year around this subject matter. And uh, I look forward to meeting you all again and, and hopefully making some progress on this subject. <clears throat> um, just to give you a quick uh, outline tonight, just of what our objective is. Um, when we left it last year, the objective was really just to come back and align ourselves with uh, COGCC regulations. But we've, we've adopted a little bit more um, uh, broader scheme now. And the objective is going to be to um, look at the oil and gas regulations and the amendments and pre prepare a set of regulations that will either exceed or align with the Colorado Oil and Gas Conservation uh, Commission regulations that were adopted in, in uh, January of this year. We're gonna do that by looking at and analyzing ourselves against the COGCC regulations, as well as other community regulations. We've already started looking at um, how our regu regulations stack up against, let's say Boulder County, because they're the only other community that I'm aware of that's um, completed regulations um, this year. Um, we're also gonna grab and gather as much input as we can from the interested members of the public, all of you, and try to understand what those issues are and how we might be able to form regulations around those. We'll assess that input um, once we've obtained it all, and then we'll develop a body of regulations that uh, will hopefully use best management practices for um, the Board of County Commissioners to consider adopting for oil and gas in Larimer County. <clears throat> and I want to remind each everybody that the project's objective has a goal and that's um, to achieve regulations that will um, accomplish uh, a system that protects the public health, safety and welfare of the, of the community as well as the environment and wildlife resources. And we all know that that comes directly from statute and, uh, Senate Bill 19181 as a directive. So how are we gonna do this over the next couple of months? We're just gonna go real quick through this so what our project schedule looks like. We're gonna be breaking it down into three phases, if you will. The first phase as I was just kind of talking about is the discovery phase. Um, the second phase will be about preparing regulations and then having public review of those before we go to the Board of County Commissioners for adoption. So during February, um, we asked you 
um, to fill out a questionnaire and we um, recovered that questionnaire this week. And so we're gonna use that information um, to give us guidance on how to proceed forward. So starting in March and working through mid-May, we're gonna perform our analysis and we're gonna conduct several public listening sessions as um, Leslie has indicated a few minutes ago. And we're gonna discuss all these topics that are listed here on the screen. And those topics um, that are listed there, which start with the purpose of the regulations and go through air and water quality setbacks, those are kind of the order of what the questionnaire told us was the order of importance that we heard from everybody. So if you wanted to understand what ranked at the higher levels, um, just look at the top of this list. So setbacks were relatively high, and I think setbacks directly relates to a lot of the subject matters um, associated with that. So we'll be taking and we will be having focused conversations around each of these subjects um, so that we're not just talking in general all the way across the board. We want to focus our conversations. So look forward to that um, happening between March and uh, mid-May. Uh, about mid-May, then we will um, take some time out and we will actually prepare the regulations. We'll, we'll look at what amendments need to be made. We'll add new stuff to the regulations and we'll come up with a draft set of regulations. And upon completion of that draft set of regulations, we will post that and the public will be allowed to have an opportunity to review and comment on that. And we will probably hold one more listening session um, to understand what everybody's thinking around those subject matters at that time. And then in July, um, that's the end of the process, we'll be really um, working to uh, go forward to the Planning Commission and the Board of County Commissioners and seek adoption of whatever body of regulations we pull together. For this. So to we'll look at that um, in, in a schematic view, that's what you can see here. This is also posted online. We replaced the last one that was out there today. Um, so you can see that we're in the three phases, discovery, preparation, and adoption. The green um, boxes or, or arrows here really represent what we believe are going to be opportunities to have public input. Time we're going to spend with you, listening to you, and understanding what your issues are and how we may best um, address those issues from the standpoint of uh, Larimer County's needs. You can see that uh, today's the third and we're having our open house here tonight. There's another one that we're planning on scheduling for March 22nd. Um, as soon as we uh, get this schedule ironed out with the Board of County Commissioners, um, we'll let you know what the topic matter is for that. I'll send out an email and we'll post it online as well. But you can see that there's a, a fair opportunity for public input. You can see here where we would have an opportunity to review the draft regulations and you can see in the red where we have opportunity for hearings um, to make sure that the public has got a good um, chance to take a look at, at what's being proposed and to offer your opinions on that to the Board of County Commissioners and to our Planning Commission. So with that, <clears throat> I'm going to close down this presentation. Um, that's kind of the short nuts and bolts of what we wanted to share with you. We have a couple of quick polling questions that we're going to ask. And Matt, yeah. while you're pulling those up, I'll just add to that schedule is, is a proposed schedule. It um, hasn't uh, gone to the county commissioners yet. We did have a discussion with them earlier in the week about extending the schedule um, to July or August. Um, any dates that we put out for hearings and things like that are always proposed and always a little bit flexible. Um, if we need more time, you know, we need more time, but we like, we like to propose a timeline and try to work toward that um, so that we, we have a goal for that. Um, additionally, that schedule is posted online. So if anybody wants to look at it more carefully, you, you could go there and, and look at that as well. Yep, yep. So with that, um, we have three polling questions. We're gonna go through them pretty quick. What we'll do is we'll put the question up. We'll give you a couple of moments to answer the, the question, and then we'll share the results with you, and then we'll move on to the next question. So um, the first question um, we're putting up here real quick. And while you all are um, answering that, you know, again, this is not a scientific um, poll. This is really just to gauge uh, if you are thinking that this is heading in the right direction. And if you have particular comments that you'd like to share about 
observations about the schedule, please put those in the chat box too, or send emails or get in touch with us in other ways. This is really just to get a general sense of going in the right direction or not. Yeah, 29 out of 43 responses, 30, we're getting close. 31, 32. Good response, people. Yeah, this is good. Okay, last chance. All right. Got 38 out, 39. It's still coming in, so I'm going to let it go until I don't see it moving very fast. Forgive our typos, too. I just noticed. <laughs> Yeah, Matt types. <laughs> <laughs> All right, here's the here's the results. Uh, so it looks like everybody, 49% uh, of everybody thinks that it seems about right. Um, the next best is that it seems a little bit rapid to be going through this process that quickly, and uh, and that. So um, we'll share this information with the board of county commissioners, make them uh, aware that uh, that uh, what the results are, and I would uh, suggest that we. Uh, that we consider whether or not there needs to be any additional time or not. All right, so I'm gonna stop sharing those results. And if you give me a second, I'm gonna pull up the second polling question. And here it is. And we do have some chat chatting going on in the chat box, so you can take a look at that as well, as as we will. Um, we had one person ask how many people are on right now. Right now, we have forty four people participating, um, including it looks like a county commissioner. I think county commissioners may also some of them opt to review the recording afterwards. Um, so thank you for, for all being here. Are you ready right. to show that one? Yeah, it looks like we have 30, 36 responses. So we're pretty good there. Um, similar to the last, uh, last polling question, it looks like uh, the majority think that we're, we're probably about right. I think in looking at that schedule, there was about six or seven opportunities to um, have meetings with all of you. And then there was some other comment opportunities. So that's a fair amount of them. Um, and then it looks like the next available was that there's not enough opportunity by about 27%. So um, maybe as we move out of the polling stage and open it up for conversation, you can share some of your thoughts on those things um, when we open it up for conversation. Yeah, particularly for those of you who answered not enough, um, we'd really like to hear what kinds of opportunities um, you're, you're interested in mostly. Um, so please do share that. Um, there are some questions about whether people can see the chat box. So um, I think only we get to it, so. Oh, okay. So, so we can summarize some of the things we're seeing in the chat box later. That may be a setting that we need to fix. Apologies about that, but um, we will save all of the chats from the chat box and we can post them online. So um, you'll be able to see everybody's comments. Um, let me see. Oh, some are saying that we can change the setting now. So somebody knows how to change the setting, put it in the chat box, please. And we'll change that setting. I'm not seeing it. Okay, we'll, well, we'll try to work that through while Matt's- um, While Leslie's doing that, I'm gonna put up the last question of, of the questions we have for you on the polling and uh, give you guys a few moments to address that. Hmm. 
Uh, somebody's saying that you can actually change the setting yourself. Um, I am not seeing that option. Um, Maybe because we're panelists. If you're seeing any chat in the chat box, then you have access to the chat box. So, um, but we will save this. So if anybody's not able to see it for some reason, we'll make sure you have access to it. <clears throat> Looks like about 34 or 35 have responded so far. So a few more. Yeah. Um, and some of you have really great suggestions about chat, but I think our settings are probably not turned on correctly to allow that because there's no blue box in the chat. <laughs> so apologies, we'll make sure we get it right for the next session. And some people are saying they can see the comment. So maybe that you individually would need to um, change the chat settings. All right, so last results. So it looks like uh, we're pretty even across here. It looks like that uh, most people are saying, uh, you know, let's either uh, exceed the state regulations on most topics or on a, a variety of select topics. And then there's the next level up at 24% is, is to just really align with the state regulations. So it looks like the majority of people want us to operate wherever possible above um, above the, the, stand, the state statutes. <clears throat> so, well, good. Those were good results. Um, we'll share this information with the commissioners when we meet with them next week and, and let them know what everybody's thinking. And, um, and then we'll make adjustments according to what the commissioners believe is appropriate. So, all right. I had a question about how many people on here are staff versus community members. Um, I do not see any staff Leah on Schneider here. Staff. So it looks like almost everybody who's on is um, a community member or somebody outside of the county organization, just for those who are asking. So I think okay. we only have one in one board of county commissioner that I saw. Right. So, okay. So I think that brings us to the portion of the meeting where we will open it up to comments and suggestions. And so if you are interested in making a comment, um, if you would raise your hand and I will keep a list of people as they raise their hands. Um, I'll try to do it in the order that that happens and we'll call on you um, to speak and, um, and then we'll move through the list. Um, and keep cycling through the list so that everybody has a chance if you want, if you have something that you'd like to share. Um, so I see um, one hand, I see Jay Young, and then Rick Casey, and then Susan. So we'll start with Jay Young. You unmute yourself, feel free to talk, Jay. Great, thank you very much. And thank you for having me on. Um, Wellington Operating is a local company that has operated oil and gas fields in Larimer County for over 30 years. Without incident and has enjoyed a positive relationship with its neighbors. It pays property severance and ad valorem taxes that benefit the county. We pay royalties to little over 20 mineral owners residing in the county. And historically, over 90% of the company's spending has been with local businesses. We share the public concerns about odors, <clears throat> emissions, and water quality. I've been in this business all my life and the industry does better than there is competent, prudent regulation. That's why we participated in the county rulemaking progress process in 2019, the COGCC processes in 2020, and we are now working diligently to comply with the new state regulations as quickly as we can. Our past comments are in the public record. We've, had, we've tried to be a constructive participant. We asked the Commissioners consider three things. First, we ask to be treated fairly. The producing oil fields in the county were mostly discovered over 50 years ago. People do have legitimate concerns about setbacks, and we do too. But while the county considers regulations limiting encroachment on existing infrastructure, air emissions 
are a concern and the state is mandating reductions in the oil and gas industry. The total horsepower of non-electric engines in our field is 360 horsepower, about the same as a mid-sized pickup. We will spend $80,000 in the coming year about the cost of two new pickup trucks to replace those engines with electric motors. Odors can be issued, but there are more gas stations than there are oil wells in the county. And three times as many feedlots and oil fields. Is the county going to give us the same scrutiny at all? Second, we recognize that not all oil and gas wells are the same. Out of the 176 active, active wells in the county, over two thirds are conventional, vertical oil wells that are operated at low pressure and produce 2% oil and 98% water. The risk to the community from 20 acre well pad with 22 mile long horizontal wells, each being fracture stimulated with 700,000 barrels of water and 50 tons of sand in a populated area are very different from a single low pressure vertical well on a half acre pad that we have. The rule should avoid prescriptive one size fits all regulations, focus on reducing risk and mitigating impacts and allow for exceptions, particularly with regard to setbacks when the affected parties mutually agree on a solution. Last and third, understand that oil and gas is not big business in Larimer County. Larimer County has a long history of oil and gas activity dating back to the 1800s, but only has 176 active wells out of almost 29,000 active wells in Northeast Colorado. There have been no new wells reported, drilled in the county since 2017. And over the past decade, the average has been about 10 new wells per year. Most of the operators in the county are privately owned small businesses like ourselves not large corporations drilling dozens of wells a year. Regulations directly impact our cost of doing business and our ability to invest in safer, cleaner operations. Thank you for your time and listening. Thank you, Jay. Thank you, Jay. And I Thank think you. that was more like three minutes. So we'll give the rest of the folks closer to three minutes. And then um, if others want to carry on with that, I think I, I, we don't have a lot of hands raised so far. So I think we could probably let everybody speak a little bit longer. Thank you for your comments. And um, Rick Casey, we have you up next. Well, th thanks very much for letting me speak. Um, I'm speaking um, for the Larimer Alliance. We're a nonprofit that's been engaged since uh, SB 181 went into effect. And we'd like to call the um, county's attention to the excellent regs that have been developed down in Boulder County. I know uh, Mr. Lafferty already mentioned the fact that you are looking at those. Uh, we think Boulder County has done a really superlative job of developing their own with calling in outside expertise to help them develop their 43 pages of regulations. And we don't see how, why Larimer County needs to reinvent the wheel. Um, just use that as a blueprint, as a starting point. We, we'd be very happy if the county did that. Thanks very much. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you, Rick. I couldn't get to my unmute button fast enough. Um, Susan Quinnell, uh, you're up next if you'd like to comment. And then we have Doug Henderson after that. Susan, you'll have to unmute. My name is Susan Quinnell and I live near Fort Collins in Larimer County. I wish to address three points regarding revised oil and gas regulations in Larimer County. Reverse setbacks, a 2000 foot setback from dwellings, schools and medical centers, as well as adequate financial protections for covering the expenses of abandoning an oil and gas well. I support efforts to ensure that Larimer County has strong and effective regulations regarding oil and gas development. As you know, Senate Bill 19-181 gave local governments the authority to pass rules stricter than the state mandates. And I ask you, uh, the county commissioners, to use your power to enact reverse setbacks to, prefer, to protect future 
residents and families from the effects of oil and gas drilling. The COGCC mandated that oil and gas drilling should not occur within 1,500 feet of homes and other occupied buildings, but it did not prohibit developers and contractors from building homes within the buffer zone of completed oil wells, pulling tanks, and other industrial facilities. Right now, the Bunker 8 facilities outside Loveland, for example, was approved by COGCC just last month, the day before new statewide regulations went into effect. Its location is only 400 feet from the already planted Mile High Estates subdivision. While it's true that there are no homes currently within the buffer, there's nothing to stop further construction within the subdivision. The Larimer Planning Commission explicitly stated that the undeveloped land was not proposed to be protected in perpetuity. Currently, oil and gas operators cannot place facility within 1,500 feet of homes, but there's nothing to prevent a developer from building homes well within this buffer zone and then selling those homes to unsuspecting families. As the Larimer Board of County Commissioners, you have the authority to enact reverse setbacks to prevent situations like this from occurring. I hope you will consider this as you revise oil and gas regulations in a way that will protect both current and future residents of our county. Additionally, since oil and gas developers have newer technologies that allow directional boring up to at least two miles underground, serious consideration should be given to extending the buffer zone to 2,000 feet from dwellings, medical facilities, and schools. Finally, I ask you to ensure that Larimer County's revised oil and glass gas regulations include adequate financial protections to ensure that bankrupt oil and gas companies don't leave county taxpayers on the hook for abandoned wells. This past year has seen an unprecedented number of bankruptcies. As the New York Times noted last summer, extraction oil and gas, Whiting Petroleum, MDC Energy, Chesapeake Energy, and Diamond Offshore Drilling, drilling all declared bankruptcy bankruptcy within just a few months last spring. Not all of these companies operate in Colorado. However, extraction oil and gas, which operates wells here in Larimer County, paid its executives a whopping 6.7 million in retention agreements last summer, just three days before declaring bankruptcy. I don't believe these companies have at health, at heart, the health, the safety, or the environment of Larimer County. Companies that pay their executives millions then go bankrupt may abandon their responsibilities for their well safety or to clean up and restore the environment after shutting down. The New York Times cites an estimated cost of $300,000 to plug a typical abandoned well. While revising oil and gas regulations mandate that any new wells have a bond of at least 300,000 to ensure that Larimer County residents like you and me don't end up paying for damage costs when oil gas operators go bankrupt. Thank you very much. Thank, Thank you. you. Next up, we have Doug Henderson. Yeah. Hi, Leslie. Hi, Matt. And hi, all that are on the call. I, I'm just speaking off the cuff. I don't have prepared marks. I wanted to respond to the very first comment. Um, and, and I think the concerns raised by that person are very legitimate. Um, I think there, there's a big difference between the small historical operators who, who have a, a long-term interest in the health and the economy of our, of our county and the new very dangerous uh, operators who are just trying to make a buck. And like the previous speaker immediately mentioned, you know, they just go bankrupt and they leave all their creditors uh, in the bag. And that can include uh, local residents and, and local governments um, with their, and, and their bad operators. And one of, the, one of the misfortunes of the smaller operators, like the very first speaker, is that they get, is that they get damaged by these larger new operators. And for those people like myself and the Larimer Alliance and others, we're concerned about the incredible damage and the history of damage, the huge evidence of damage by these, these operators, these very large industrial scale pads coming into neighborhoods um, and doing tremendous damage to neighborhoods. They're not talking about one or two wells, they're talking about 
20, 30 wells uh, with big, huge laterals. They're talking about, about millions of gallons of what they call produced water, which is actually just toxic waste. They use the term water because it makes it sound innocuous. It's not innocuous at all. It's toxic waste. They pump it underground. There's all kinds of emissions. They emit benzene to schools. Uh, extraction was caught in, in, with a benzene leak right next to Bello Romero School in Weld County. And they do that kind of stuff all extraction was responsible for the Stromberger explosion three days before Christmas in 2017, uh, an incredible toxic explosion that, that put a plume of toxics all over the front range before Christmas in 2017. If you were out Christmas shopping, you were breathing toxics. Um, and that was because they didn't have air quality monitoring that captured the fact that they had a, a serious methane emission going for many hours before that explosion. And that's the kind of concern that, that citizens like myself are concerned about and organizations like the Larimer Alliance are speaking about. It's not the small operators. Maybe there are some small operators that need to clean up more, but, but, but the concerns there are not the big concerns. The concerns are the big mega pads. And, and, and unfortunately, it's the oil and gas industry lobbyists who are representing these huge uh, operations, and those are the ones that are sociopathic uh, in their treatment of, of local communities and environment. So that's what we're talking about. Anyway, those are off-the-cuff comments. I, I want to say that, that I want the local operators, like the first person, to understand that we are not trying to stop them. We are trying to stop the, the danger of the much bigger operators like the immediate previous speaker mentioned. Thank you, Doug. Yes, thank you. Um, next up, I have uh, Deb Bjork and then Mary B after that. Oh, uh, okay, yeah, that's right. Tim, you had your hand up, but it's no longer up. So if you still wanna speak, please raise, okay. <laughs> so um, Tim, we'll come to you right after Mary and uh, after Deb and then Mary. Deb, you'll have to unmute yourself. Oh, there we go. Th Hi, Leslie. Hi, Matt. Thank <clears> you. <throat> um, so I'm a little bit confused because I thought that Wellington Operating was own, owned by uh, J or by Pomeroy, and that um, the Wellington Water it, part of it is run by Rick Evans. So I, Jay Young, I thought you were from Texas. So, and so, you know, there's a little, Doug was saying, you know, concern about who comes into our state and what their intentions are. And, um, and I think there are, I'm sure that there are many companies who try to do well. However, this is our, our um, county and it's the place that's our home. And so, it matters to us um, how people approach our um, oil and gas uh, development. Um, as a person who is a, a representative in a coalition, uh, as a party through rulemaking at the state level, I guess my biggest concern for the county in revising regulations is that it is incredibly complex. I think even with your current timeline, and I do appreciate the um, public um, opportunities you've given for public process and comments. However, it does not appear that there's very many opportunities once you have released the draft. And that's a bigger concern because we can talk tonight about what our concerns are, but we have no idea what's going to be written up. And that, that happened last year. The, you know, the draft was released in um, January and the planning commission hearing was early February. We had only a couple of weeks after seeing what was actually in the final draft. And so I guess I would ask you to look at your timeline and make a longer process once we know what's in there. Um, because there are, there are, as you know, um, so many areas that need to be addressed. And um, that itself with a draft, if you really want public input, could take a, a deal of time. So thank you for that. Thank you for that comment, Deb. And we will definitely look at the timeline and, and make sure that there's adequate time for um, comments at the end as well. So um, 
Let's see, we have Mary B up next and then Tim Gosar after that and then Andrew after that. Can I ask if, was Susan Quinnell up before any of them? I'm sorry, I wasn't paying attention. Um, she spoke and Susan, your hand is up. I'm not sure if it's still up. And if, you, if you'd like to speak again, we'll come back to you sure. after others have a chance to speak um, for their first time. It looks like maybe it was still up. Okay, so I prompted Mary. Yeah, hi, good evening. Uh, Matt and Leslie, thank you. You guys know me. Uh, I just wanted to say, um, yes, thank you for the extra time for public participation and extending the timeline. I agree with all those things. Um, as far as regulations themselves, uh, I do, you know, I, I'm hoping the county will choose to look at areas they can go beyond what's what the state is doing. Um, big area of concern for me is the completions. So kind of lost you, Mary. Which there is a big difference. Um, and the a concern when you take a conventional well and you convert it to an unconventional well. So then you are changing the status of that well and um, reintroducing, you know, chemicals and other things into that formation. Sorry, I'm out of breath. I was chasing my daughter. Um, so that's, that's a big concern. And I, I think, you know, with the um, Wellington operating, if, um, if I'm understanding correctly, is that they do have plans to convert some of these wells. So that would be something I'd hope, you know, not just with Wellington, but um, in general with recompletions that we look at all those impacts um, and what that can do converting a conventional well to an unconventional well that may be by homes that and originally it wasn't. Um, so recompletions are something that I hope the, the county will look at closely. Thank you, that's it. Thank you. Thanks, Mary. Uh, next up we have Tim Gosar. Can you hear me okay? Yes, sir. Right. Thanks, Matt. Thanks, Les Leslie, for putting this on and for the county for sponsoring a chance to be able to have some public participation. I would just ask um, the county to consider a, a few different things when it comes to new oil and gas regulations. First, setbacks. Uh, I, we hear all the time about the industry uh, and how well and how good their technology is about lateral drills up to two miles. So I would challenge them if that's the case and that's the technology than 2,500 foot setbacks that are scientifically safe for people from home, schools, public spaces uh, is something they, I would agree, or they would, they should agree that uh, is protective for public health, safety, and the environment. Second thing I, I would, would uh, uh, ask the county to, to do would be uh, 365-24-7 air quality monitoring. Um, we have some of the worst air quality in the country. Uh, as a matter of fact, 19th out of uh, 219 metropolitan areas uh, with the American Lung Association giving us an F in air quality. So I know that there are operators on this call and saying that um, you know, their, their um, business is safe and the industry is safe and it just isn't because most of that air quality and the problems with our air quality comes from Well County oil and gas operations. So um, I, I would like the, the county to really consider a hard 2,500 foot setback with no exceptions. Um, and if there are any exceptions, it would be uh, maybe to uh, 2,000 foot at the, at the very least. I would also say about the financial assurance that this is an oil, uh, oil and gas is a boom and bust type business. And uh, um, I believe that uh, what should happen with the financial assurance is an ongoing financial assurance with all current financial assurances filed with the COGCC. Tax returns for um, the prior five years. I would ask for operators insurance with minimum limits of 1,000 each occurrence, 2,000 general aggregate, and 2,000 products completed operations aggregate. Automobile coverage, workers' compensation, employers' liability and umbrella excess, professional E&O, pollution liability insurance and, covered, and, and coverage required. And I believe Larimer County should be listed as an additional insured with the operator subs. So any subcontracts having the necessary insurance. So I think there's lots of room for uh, the county to be able to really um, dig in on the financial assurance and make that an ongoing process. The other thing I would uh, 
finish up with is that oil and gas uses a lot of, of, of water. And I think that they should be paying for that water because once it is used, it is no longer uh, able to be reused in any public capacity. Um, I know that that's what the industry says, that they can uh, use this produce water in a, vi uh, a variety of settings, but I would challenge them then to go and get some of that produced water and water their plants and eat those things that they're um, watering those plants, the, the, the food and vegetables that they're producing from that produced water. So I would challenge them because I just do not believe that is true. So I believe that the water should be an issue in the new oil and gas regulations. I appreciate the opportunity to be able to uh, talk to you guys and the public participation tonight. And I think I would leave it at that. Thank you. Okay. Thank you, Tim. Um, next up, we have Andrew Forks Gudmundson. I'm probably mispronouncing that. My apologies. Um, I'll mention too while he's getting on that um, while you might see Matt and, and me on the screen uh, tonight, we do have uh, partners in the health department who are working on this and the attorney's office and, and many others who are going to be part of this project as well, looking at the, um, the regulations. So I think some of the topics that um, some of you are raising um, would be important for those partners to be considering as well. So um, Andrew, we'll turn it over to you. Thanks so much. I really appreciate the opportunity to uh, provide comments in this setting. Um, and you got quite close to the last name. That's Andrew Forkus Goodmanson. I'm coming to you as the Deputy Director of the League of Oil and Gas Impact of Coloradans. Um, we work quite closely with a number of residents in Larimer County from the Larimer Alliance and elsewhere. And uh, I'm here on behalf of them and on behalf of making Colorado a safer place through these Larimer County regulations. So um, first I wanted to ask a question and you can get to it at your convenience, I guess. Um, but I'd like to know if you guys are still on track for um, producing your comparison between the uh, existing Larimer County regs and the COGCC in Boulder. And I believe there are a few other jurisdictions um, suggested uh, at the last work group. Um, and then I'd, I'd like to echo, I think it was Deb Bjork that made this comment that a lot of the opportunity for public comment is front loaded. And I'd like to offer a potential solution. Um, during the COGCC process, uh, when they were rewriting, you know, hundreds of pages of regulations, one thing that I felt was quite effective in our work there was uh, they produced what were what they called straw dogs, which was not something that I had ever heard as a term before, but they were basically very rough draft regulations that indicated a sort of directional intent from the commission staff and uh, interested parties, in that case, it was actual parties, um, were able to um, comment on those straw dogs and provide early red lines so that the county or the, the COGCC wasn't tied to what became what were uh, first drafts and were working on a, um, a, on, a, on a narrower timeline. So I would encourage you to consider something like that where you create, even if it's a bare bones outline, something to guide public comment, because right now, in a setting like this, we're limited to sort of, you know, vague generalizations where we're, um, you know, hoping for things to be in the regulations, but we don't actually know where the regulations are heading makes it really difficult to provide meaningful public comment. So um, providing an opportunity to engage directly on drafts on paper, even if they're not um, what you think might the, the final drafts might be, I think would be really helpful and would probably generate significantly more useful comments than um, just having like 15 settings like this. It's great to talk to you, but it'd be nice to talk to you about something specific, um, like a red line or a straw dog or whatever. I think yeah, that's all. Thank, thank you for that. And, um, was that your final comment? I didn't mean to cut you off. Yeah, it was. <laughs> okay. So yes, I, I, our intention is to produce drafts and allow people to weigh in on those as, as this unfolds. Um, and we'll make sure that there is an opportunity because yes, we totally understand that you don't wanna see something in the 11th hour that everybody's scrambling to comment on and that you wanna have a chance to see them along the way. So, um, so that will do. Um, and your first question about, are we on track with the analysis? Um, Matt's been doing a ton of work on that and we will have um, some additional help on that also. So we won't have a completed version of that for next week, but our goal is to have a very solid complete version that um, can be used for comparison by the end of the month and certainly by the time we have 
um, the next event such as this uh, at the end of March, March 22nd. So that is our goal at this point um, on that analysis document. Matt, did you want to add anything to that? No, I think it's just a really good point to say that we are working on it and, and we did compare Boulder County. Um, I looked at the regs, Boulder County is the only one that's actually updated their regs based upon the new COGCC rules. So they're ahead of everybody else. Adams County, Broomfield, um, a lot of those communities that are out there like that are also in the same position we are in right now. They're updating their stuff and, and trying to figure it all out. And, uh, and we've been given an opportunity to, to pull in some additional help, some expert help. Um, and we're looking at some people right now to come in and help us put this together so that we have that assistance because we're working on a few other things. But um, so hopefully by March 22nd, we'll have a pretty solid outline and we will be able to have focused discussions on, on various subject matter rather than spreading across a whole bunch of topics. Thanks. So um, we have Randy Evans, who's had his hand up. And Andrew, it looks like you're, okay, not not anymore. Um, Gayla, your hand was up. I'm not sure if you're still interested. If so, put your hand up and we'll put you in the queue. Okay, so and Randy, it, go ahead. <laughs> Andrews did go back up, so. Thank you. Uh, I'm Randy Evans. I am the water treatment operator. Uh, the, operator in responsible charge for the Wellington operating Wellington Water Works facility. Uh, just, I don't know that it's been made public yet, but Mr. Young is the new owner of Wellington operating. Uh, Brad Pomeroy was the owner. And after he lost his son a little over two years ago, he wanted to get out of the business and he arranged for the sale and that's where Mr. Young has come in now. I, uh, in seeing both sides of the water treatment and the oil field operations, I would urge the county to stay closer to the state uh, regulations and rules with COGCC as if you come along six months or a year from now with a complete set of, or completely different set of uh, requirements, the small companies like this that are going through to make the changes uh, for meeting the new requirements, now they have to do it again, is putting an undue uh, burden on those companies to do something like that. Ex accepting the state rules and regulations at the county level makes more sense than pushing to have something much more stringent. And that, that's my personal opinion. And I appreciate the time to speak uh, for the company. Thank you. Thank you, Randy. Thanks, Randy. Uh, Gayla Martinez, you are up next. And Andrew, I see your hand up too. We'll see if any others who haven't spoken would like to speak and then we'll come to you again. Go ahead, Gayla, thank you. Okay, thank you. First and foremost, um, I do wanna say thank you to the staff for having extended our timeline <clears throat> and for having um, just such an openness to hear public comment and um, to, to get as much input as possible during this process. It's very much appreciated and I want you to know that. Um, in addition, I'd just like to briefly make a comment regarding um, what I've heard so far this evening I think the perspective of most of the people who have made comments is that of someone who considers themselves to be native to this place. Now, I don't think native necessarily means that you have to be born here. Um, it can be the perspective of someone like myself whose family has been here for over 150 years, but it could also be the perspective of someone who maybe just recently moved in here but has put down roots and this is their home and this is the place they're committed to. Um, and those perspectives, I would point out, are quite different from the goals of outside investors coming from outside the state who really primarily want to make money and, you know, make their profits and then leave. Um, it's a very different angle to be coming from. And, and I couldn't help but notice that, um, in a sense, I feel both 
Matt and Leslie are providing me here with some, some metaphors as to what our goals should be. Um, Leslie, you have a beautiful picture behind you. <laughs> and I don't know if that's Colorado or not, but it could, it could be. And to me, that represents the heritage that we are all trying to protect. Um, and we're gonna have to work really hard because we know we've got air quality issues. We know as the community grows and we have population growth, it's gonna take extra effort to be able to, to protect that heritage that has been passed down from us even since the time of the original um, indigenous people that, that lived here first. And then Matt, I noticed your Harley Davidson sign. You represent the future <laughs> because I hear that this is a future looking company that has actually already been working on developing um, electric powered um, motorcycles and so forth. I don't know if those are being accepted or popular, but I have to congratulate the company for making that effort. They're thinking outside of the box. They're working hard to adjust to the new realities we're all facing. And we can't just stick with the status quo. It's gonna take a lot of work on everyone's part, both to protect the heritage and to be able to give a legacy that we're proud of to, to those who come after us. But again, thank you. That's it. Thank you. Thank you. So um, I see that Nancy York has her hand up. Good evening. You can hear me, I presume? Yes, yes. ma'am. Well, so I, I want to speak to the fact uh, what many, many, many studies have uh, pointed to the uh, impact on health and uh, 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 what recent what studies indicate is that this the pollution from oil and gas and and vehicles and other things uh, touch uh, touch every organ in our body. Can you not hear me very loud? Am I? Sh oh, you sound fine. Yeah, we can hear you. So, uh, so the impact is is significant and it can be it is life changing for instance if even in utero they uh it, it can affect a a child it can shorten you know it can affect their hearts their brains every every organ in our body it's uh the impact is that significant and therefore the goal should be the uh, the uh, reduction of emissions and holding holding oil and gas producers to a very very high uh, uh, very high uh, standard, and that they should all and it is that important. Um, I, I can't even tell you how important and and I would be happy to share the studies with you if if you would be interested and I and I see John Kafalis is on and I've actually shared some of those uh, with him. So the standard should be very, very high because of its importance on human health. And one so so. So that that's really the main my main thing. But nobody has talked about climate change, and the very and that is also a very very serious thing. At, uh, and that we cannot we we must do our utmost to address it. And uh, I believe that truly that we need to to abandon fossil fuels and look for, look towards renewable energies. And, and we should do it in our own lives, you know, lower the thermostat, not drive your car so much, turn off the lights. We should take it very, very seriously because it is serious. And, um, and I don't mean to sound like a, extremist, but the situation is extreme. Thanks very much for, for your listening and uh, wish you all the very best and reduce your energy, reduce your energy use. <laughs>
Thank you. Thank you, Nancy. Tricia? Good evening. Thank you for the opportunity to speak. Um, I am an environmental scientist. I represent the Small Operator Society, which is a coalition of approximately 60 plus small oil and gas companies, which currently operate over 11,000 active wells across the state of Colorado. Our members commist almost exclusively of family owned and operated businesses, producing low pressure, low volume vertical assets, which are larger than the rural areas throughout our state. We were formed in 2019 in response to Senate Bill 181 and our overall regulatory environment in the state. Our mission is to represent our members interest in the face of the increased regulatory environment, providing risk-based and evidence-supported comments and constructive feedback and reasonable solutions that allow us to stay in business while continuing to operate in a responsible, safe manner, protective of the environment and public health and welfare. Our typical SOS member operates less than 100 wells, each with marginal economics, an average net monthly cash flow of approximately $1,000. Most of our members' operates are located in rural areas and present a significant contribution to the local rural economy via the royal royalties to the farmers, mineral owners, utilization of locally owned small businesses, and tax revenue to local governments, such as Larimer County. In 2019, we estimated that our members had production of uh, approximately 4,000 BOE, or I'm sorry, 4 million BOE, which equated to over 17 million in royalty payments and almost 7 million in ad valorem tax payments. The SOS operators are significant contributors to our local and well paying jobs in the areas that need them. The final well being of our SOS companies is closely tied to the individual owners, and these owners are often a close knit part of the local community. Put simply, the livelihoods depend on operating safely, responsibly, and in a manner that's protective of the environment, public health, and welfare, where we live and where we work. In this critical aspect, I represent SOS members to state that we differ from other operators in the state, and our concerns are relatively proposed regulations that impact the regulatory changes that bring to our small businesses are also different. In that vein, we want to make sure that we're actively engaged in the local county regulations such as Larimer County, and we provide a position that is different than most. Um, with that said as well, as an environmental scientist and being a part of the ongoing rulemaking that has occurred through mission change, Colorado has one of the strictest regulations within our country. We have the strictest air regulations in our country, if not in the world. Just recently, we passed an addition to Reg 7, which also allowed for a constructive communication between the division, the um, NGOs and industry to bring apart a, agreed upon pneumatic rulemaking. Again, reducing emissions from our industry. And in, in addition, there were some statements made in the comments regarding produced water. Our produced water in our state at, with analytical data that has proven it is agriculturally usable for certain aspects based with, with treatment. We also passed Reg 84, which allows for other uses of produced water post treatment. So be careful what you state without looking at the science and the facts. We wanna to continue to engage with you and make sure that our operators in your communities are engaged with as we wanna work with you and make sure that you understand that we are part of the communities and the environment means a lot to us. Thank you. Thank you, Tricia. So next up we have, oh, we had Tom Rhodes, but um, are you still interested in speaking? If so, raise your hand. And if not, um, I think we can open this up to anybody who may have made a prior comment who's interested in speaking again. Okay, um, I see Doug. Yeah, hi. I, I've become hey. aware that the very first speaker who I was responding to is, um, I think, Jay Young, who, who is the Texas uh, investor advertising an investment scheme that would, um, he's promoting the development of a couple of hundred wells in northern Larimer County. 
um, in an area that really doesn't have wells at this point. Um, and what I would say about that is that, you know, provided that he can develop those wells in a way that meet the absolute highest standards of protection of health, safety, and environment, then fine. Um, but he presented it it's like these are going to just be small pump jack operations, and that is not the kind of operation that we see generally coming in with new industry. They're coming in with huge mega pads. They produce tens of millions of gallons of toxic waste. They have major emissions. They flare. They vent. They have lots of trucks. They invade neighborhoods, um, and they and they tend to lie about what they do. If we look at the history of the past 10 years of big new oil and gas operators across the front range, they lie and they lie and they lie. Uh, and they have accidents and they have explosions and they have fires about once a month and they, and they put out nice green propaganda. So I don't know what Mr. Young really envisions for the front for the future. If he can really produce nice clean operations, that's fine, but if he's, if he's advancing the kind of operations that we see uh, elsewhere in the front range, these big mega pads and a loss of pollution and, and, and invasion and endangerment of local people, no, that is not okay. And we will fight that tooth and nail. Thank you, Doug. And I see um, Jay Young raised his hand, so he may wish to respond to that. And then Deb York is after that. Thank you very much. I appreciate that. And I, I um, you know, I'll opine on that. We, there's no way that we could drill hundreds of wells. And a lot of things have changed, obviously, over the, over the you know, last couple of years. Um, and I'm not sure what scheme or whatever, which I take offense to. I mean, my, my family's been in the business over 100 years. Yes, Brad did retire on Monday. And we honored, we honored that and appreciate him. We've got Randy Evans, Cam Gracie, Tom Shaw, Jay Evans. I mean, guys that have been in this business for for decades and have been here for a long time. And we're going to do everything within the Larimer County regulations and take care of the regulations. So, I, I'm, yes, I appreciate you saying that. And I appreciate you saying that if we're clean, and we're going to go back in and do some reworks. We don't envision drilling long laterals and fracking and using hundreds of thousands. We do not envision that at all. Um, thanks to the you know Wellington operating company, we can be we can be very very uh, clean and we can uh, take care of business. And everybody needs oil. We still need oil in the United States. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Kevin Krause is up next. Oh, sure. Thank you. Yeah. So just succinctly from me, um, just a resident in Larimer County, no affiliations with anything specifically. Uh, you know, this is our opportunity to, to prioritize health and environment, which every single one of us needs and cares about. And I just, I'd like to see the revisions focused on that. I mean, plain and simple, it's not about what the operators desire. Um, that's not, that's not our opportunity here. It's to, as uh, some of the other folks talk to, you know, the legacy we leave and what we're living in now. So I just, just to call out and uh, push toward that needs to be the focus. Appreciate the industry, you know, had the opportunity to drive a car today. I get the mentality that we need it, but we have to be more forward looking and protect health, environment, and, and just prioritize those above all else. Thanks. Thank you. At this point, uh, there are no other hands raised. So we'll give everybody an, another opportunity to do so if you're interested in making a comment. Okay, I do see Tim Gosar. You'd like to jump in, Tim? The point I would make, if you can hear me okay, is that um, in the past, um, the oil and gas industry has been given a pass when they say they don't pollute, they don't spill, they're a good neighbor. Uh, it seems like they get this pass that the public has to prove otherwise. 
And I believe that Senate Bill 181 is a little different and it's a kind of a seismic shift where now the oil and gas industry should have to prove that they're safe before there's drilling. They should have to prove that they're financially capable before there's a permit given. They should have to prove that they have the ability to be able to operate in our community in a safe and effective manner in respect to health, safety, the environment and wildlife resources. So I believe that that's what I hope the, uh, the county will keep its eyes on. And I believe that water should be a big part of the issue in the regulations going forward because it's a precious uh, resource that I don't believe um, is factored in and the amount of uh, water that's used in oil and gas is astounding. It's astounding. And so I would challenge that environmental scientist that um, I've read much uh, literature about produced water and how uh, ineffective and how dangerous it can be to be able to put it back into our food systems. Um, so I would uh, 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 ask her to be able to the new regulations now that I believe they should have to prove that that produced water is something that can be used. So I would hope that uh, when we're looking at the oil and gas regulations that we're gonna look at this from the spirit of SB 181 and that is protective of health, safety, environment and wildlife resources. Thanks again for this uh, chance to address you guys. I really appreciate it. Okay, th thank you, Tim. Um, I see Elizabeth, I'm sure I'm gonna mispronounce it, Hud Hudet? Okay, and yeah. then Trisha Fanning is right after that, who may have some comments um, regarding Tim's comments. Thank you. Yeah, um, I agree with um, Mr. Gosar. Um, the SB 181 changed the playing field and they're supposed to prove that it's safe and they really cannot prove that because it isn't safe. Uh, Doug's right, there are approximately about one accident a month, lots of deaths, and they don't want to set it back 2,500 feet from homes, and which is a shame because that's exactly what the fire department says is the minimum distance for when they do explode, which they do. Um, sorry about that, people, we're so sorry, but you know, ruined uh, lives get ruined and uh, ended. Um, and I'm, I'm with a group, a uh, medical symposium group, uh, Physicians for Social Responsibility, and we've had two seminars and many, many speakers, um, and they're uh, talking about how people's health is affected, and it is a fact. They can't, that's why they can't really prove it's safe, because it degrades people's health that, that live by it. Um, and water's ruined, air is ruined. Basically, we're killing our planet and fossil fuels is one of the main, if not the main contributor. Uh, we're doing other things though. We're killing every bug we can, anything that's inconvenient. We pretty much, you know, we want to poison it and um, we're, we're kind of killing ourselves. We don't see it yet though, because we're, we're too busy trying to, you know, tread water, make a living and every, nobody wants to lose their job, even if it's, a destructive job that's, you know, killing us. Um, and we don't really need gas, we need energy. Yeah, but there are lots of different ways to get energy. And yes, right now it is all really set up for the oil and gas industry, but you know, they have gotten um, trillions of dollars every year from our, our federal government in subsidies. So um, that's one reason that it has been cheaper take that away and it's a whole different scenario and um yeah i don't think they're they're very they're not really very honest about what they do and they're not really answerable to anybody there's not you know when there is um a self-reported in uh issue like if there's an explosion or something it is a self-reporting industry and they don't really have to report if it's under I don't know is it five gallons I don't I don't really know what the amount is um but I know it's a self-reporting industry and they they don't of course report everything just what they have to um and um so I really don't have a high regard for the industry because yeah it's an industry and every industry gets that gets to a certain size it's like any organism it wants to maintain stasis it wants to stay alive and it's going to do whatever it has to to do that and it wants to grow even which is you know unchecked growth is is what cancer is 
So um, I think we've gotten, um, we've also, they, they, since they do have more money than just the common people, I've been uh, a petitioner, we've, we've done initiatives, put them on ballots, and then oil and gas comes in, and with our, our tax dollars in subsidies, they, um, they, they have a bigger voice than we do. And they say whatever they want to. They talk about how they keep our schools alive. While I actually did research and testified at some of the hearings, the Senate and the House hearings uh, for SB 181. And the fact is that they did contribute a lot around uh, up till, Oh, gosh, I don't remember the exact years, but uh, they had some really good years. And then they had some years where they didn't contribute. Uh, they the uh, the state um, records or the state um, uh, data was in hundreds of millions of dollars and they didn't even contribute one hundred million dollars. When I looked at a number of the years, it was uh, maybe 2000. Uh, anyway, it was over 10 years ago that they had their biggest contributions and it's been pretty lean since then. So. Um, I, I don't think we need oil and gas. Uh, we, and I've actually heard scientists say, if we just burn what's already been extracted, we're dead. We are dead. I mean, how, how many insects do you see around today? You used to drive to Denver or from Fort Collins and you'd have your, your windshield covered in bugs. That is not the case anymore. Scientists on NPR have said that um, the bug population since 1970 has decreased 95%. So we're and Elizabeth, with we'll yeah. ask you to wrap up if you don't mind. We've got some yeah. other speakers um, behind you in line. Sure, um, but also I know we use it for plastics. But again, the plastics are um, getting into our oceans, and we're eating them now in our food because the animals in the ocean eat them. So it's a huge problem. We don't need any more oil and gas. Okay. Thank we you, Elizabeth Larimer. Thank you very much for the opportunity to speak. Okay. Um, we have Trisha and then Tom Rhodes uh, with their hands up. So Trisha, you're up next. Thank you. Thank you. So just to address some of the um, statements that have been made throughout the evening. So um, Colorado operators, just like oil and gas throughout our country, we're not only abided by the regulations of the state, but we are also abided by regulations of the federal government. So specifically to our water, Clean Water Act, number one, as well as some of the strictest regulations subject within our own state for air, water, and waste controls. Also, the misnomer to assume that our industry has not been regulated since the passing of Senate Bill 181 is completely false. We have an lead precedent in our country with having some of the strictest rules. And to make a statement that oil and gas operators falsely report or choose not to report is wrong. Um, you're treating operators as if we ourselves take human life at a different level than anyone else does that chooses to work in any other industry. Also, in a broad statement, oil and gas operators are not made up with just those that are on the extractable side, but also anywhere from myself as an environmental scientist, geologists, engineers, pipe fitters, electricians, pumpers, truck drivers, you name it, we are ingrained in every facet of operations in every community throughout this country. So assuming that you can just do away with oil and gas is a very simple statement that doesn't take into the fact that our state currently operates still 30% coal, 60% oil and gas, and at best 10% from any alternative energy. So it is a necessity and we are very strict on what we do. We document Senate Bill 181 did increase record keeping and reporting requirements and added additional measures, but it is not correct to state that we are an unregulated entity and a corporation that doesn't take it seriously. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Tricia. Um, Tom Rhodes, you're up next.
Yes, thank you. Um, my comment actually, I guess, is more in the form of a question. And I'd just like to get some confirmation on this. Um, my understanding is that the current regulations, which were adopted about a year ago, are currently in effect and will remain in effect until the county commission adopts new ones. Um, and that also recompletions are specifically excluded from regulation at the county level. So my question is, does that mean that the county will pass on any opportunity to comment to the COGCC on any recompletion permits that may be submitted between now and when new regulations take effect next time? Go ahead, Matt. Um, <laughs> thank you. Um, good question, Tom. The, the, re, the state of Colorado, in their most recent answer to us on recompletions was recompletions are a downhole activity. And as a downhole activity, um, there's no public comment period that's afforded to us. So we would have to comment another way or whatnot. However, um, we will probably have a conversation with our Board of County Commissioners in the next week or so about when there is a downhole activity such as a recompletion if that causes additional new surface impacts, let's say that it increases the amount of traffic to haul materials um, on a regular basis or adds new tanks or generators or things to the surface um, to keep that operation alive, that's new activity. And I think that that would be new surface activity that we would want to process through our application procedures. And with, with response to where our regulations are, Yes, our regulations do apply. So that means that any new oil and gas facilities that come to Larimer County have to go through our process right now. And <clears throat> as they go through that process, um, if our standards are anywhere less than the state standards, then we have to um, elevate that discussion to the state standards level. Thank you for the clarification. Yes, sir. Thank you, Tom. And I think that brings us to the end of verbal comments. Uh, there aren't other hands up. Um, we are saving the chat. Um, there've been a number of comments there too. So we'll save that and make that available. Um, we're also recording this session. So this was all very valuable, helpful input, both about the schedule and the process and also about particular um, topics within the regulations that you're interested in um, making sure that we address as we move forward. So um, please do stay with us through the next few months and continue to provide comments and ideas. Um, you can always send emails to us too and, and let us know um, if there are ways of participating that would be helpful to you or, or that you'd be interested in seeing as well as uh, substantive comments on um, drafts as we move forward. Um, I think with that, we would probably move to start wrapping up here fairly soon, unless anybody has some fin a final comment. I would just make one final comment that um, as we proceed through these um, amendments, um, there's always been, and, and we did it last year as well, we talk a lot about things that are really policy driven, driven type issues that that aren't part of standards. So, um, you know, should the county have a continuous air quality monitoring program countywide, for instance, that's that's something worthy of discussion and this and that. But those tend to be policy issues that we may or not be able to answer with regulations. So as we move forward, we we'll want to make sure that we focus on trying to get strategies and, and rules into place that actually address how these things would or would not occur on the ground. And so I look forward to working with all of you. Um, it's, it's really kind of an exciting topic sometimes. It uh, makes me want to pull my hair out, but I don't have any more to pull. But uh, I really do look uh, forward to working with everybody from uh, all different perspectives. All right, well, thank you very much, everybody. And um, we will be in touch and I'm sure we'll have many more of these conversations going forward. So thank you very much for, for being here this evening and um, we'll see you again soon.
Bye, everybody. And Matt, we'll stick around for just a minute and make sure we have everything saved, pro saved properly. <laughs> That was really helpful to listen in on the conversations. Um, there is a lot of terminology that I need to get up to speed with, Matt. <laughs> and we are still recording and we still have people on. So <laughs> thank you, Jen. <laughs> I'll stop there. All right. And I think we have the chat saved and I think we're probably ready to go ahead and You've got it recorded, right, Matt? Are we good? Okay, you're muted. <laughs>